Blitz and Trapper! How's everybody doing? What's going on? You guys all right? Hmm. Really great to be here. How do you feel about being inducted into the Oregon Music Hall of Fame? It's pretty weird. It's it's a yeah. uh, surreal. I don't know. Just because it's a marker, it's such a marker of how long we've been doing it. So twenty five years in March. Yeah, that's a long time. And that's amazing. I mean, really, mm -hmm. twenty five years. Yeah, it's, it's longer than I've done anything else in my life. Yeah. Yeah, likewise, and it's longer than most other bands survive. I mean, can't count the number of bands that we've known that have lasted maybe six months or a year. Yeah, most businesses fail after the first year or before, so it's yeah. kind of the same with bands. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I was in, I don't know how many bands before this, probably 10, 12, and that was, you know, in a four or five year span in Salem. So, yeah, it's, it's rare to, to have that kind of longevity. How many albums? I think tw we just put out our 12th, and then there's a number of EPs and live things. Yeah. And touring, you're touring. Okay. Not now, but but um, we just did a July tour and then have a, a an East Coast tour in November is coming up, mm -hmm. and that's like two and a half weeks long, and it'll probably be the last one for a while. I don't know if Eric's planning on on touring uh, next year, uh, and I don't know if he's going to write a new record. I never really know until he writes one, oh, yeah. which is a shame he couldn't be here because. Um, He's, he's going to have a lot more poignant answers to questions about the songwriting. But, yeah. Yeah. but I've been with him for 31 years now. When you think about your career, you know, like I said, long time. Um, what is the key to your longevity, really? I think we just had the right combination of personalities to really be able to survive out on the road for that long. I mean, you know, we... We spent the bulk of our uh, touring career just in a van. You know, we weren't in buses, in like separate zones, and, and in any way, we were really close together. So we'd all just like over time had built up a, a good enough of a skill set to be able to like deal with each other's quirks and, you know, sort of shrug off anything that we didn't like. And I don't know. We're small town friends that helped. He and I played in a band in 97 called the Halter Tops. <laughs> uh, Sorry, that's a good name for it. Excellent. Yeah. Did you uh, have, uh, we didn't ladies? wear any Halter Tops. No. no. Did you have young ladies dancing around in Halter Tops? No. no. It, was kind of, it was pretty much like a, a, like a Dandy Warhol's sort of copy band. Yeah. Like vi aesthetically vibey. Yeah. And it was like in that family of music. Yeah. Um, but we've just known each other for a long time. We went to the same high school. Uh, we're all from Salem except for Marty, who's a Yakimite, and uh, we just, I think it was just uh, in a small town like Salem, anyone who plays for a few years is going to meet most of the other musicians who are playing, and, and I think we, when we moved to Portland and started playing together, we still had the small town mentality and gave away our music for three years and, and just played shows for the fun of it. And, um, we gestated for seven years before we ever did our first tour. So I think what, by the time we did start hitting the road, any kind of challenges that came up, came up were pretty easily dealt with just within the dynamic of being friends. So it, I think that's it. And also just Eric writes incredible music and just is really prolific and continues to write records even now. He's, he just put one out in May that is incredible and he just uh, was always a really fun person to support. You know about the mission, I'm assuming, of the Oregon Music Hall of Fame, which is basically to fund music education in schools mm -hmm. in Oregon. And I'm sure you also know the music education situation here has really been cut. What do you, what do you think of that? Or maybe even reflect on your musical education experiences when you were younger that got you into this whole thing. We both were in, in musical education programs in school. He was in a, uh, an award-winning... Uh, string orchestra. The, yeah. the string orchestra at Sprague High School. Our, uh, our teacher there, Stephen Nelson, was like 
I would be nowhere near the player that I am today without uh, without his influence. He really kind of was one of those teachers that kind of pushed you to involve your emotions in what you were doing. And um, yeah, I mean, it was massively important. That was like, that kind of gave me the whole groundwork to even like start to mess around and play rock music at all. In Sprague, I, where I also went, there was a, a choir teacher named Gary Frame who has passed away, but he was really passionate about vocal arrangements, about composition, and uh, and he was very accepting and encouraging of me, of me as a shy er, uh, singer when I was just getting started in high school. And the music teacher, Andre Hagestad, he uh, was also very supportive and encouraging, and I had been playing clarinet for years unhappily because I wasn't allowed to play sax. My family thought that saxophone was a satanic instrument, so I was forbidden on religious grounds to play it. And so I told uh, Mr. Hagestad that, I was like, I think I'm going to quit the band because I'm not allowed to play sax, that's like all I want to do. And uh, he was like, well, I have a giant bass clarinet sitting in the back that no one uses. It's kind of like a sax, but it's a clarinet. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So I, <laughs> last like year and a half, I did bass clarinet, and it was, it was cool. And, but that, that was like right before I decided to stand my ground with my family and be like, if I can't have an, a guitar, I'm just going to quit music. So, but but the, the, uh, the support that I got from my teachers was huge. And they were more supportive of me playing music than my family was. So... Mm. That that's enormous, and I, I I only remember like by the time I was starting to graduate, I was about to graduate, and after I graduated, seeing that that programs all around Oregon were starting to cut down, and that was like in the, the mid '90s. So I'm I'm not I wouldn't be surprised if things are in a much worse place now, hmm. sadly, you know. And I, if the trend is, you know, the teachers are having to support their own teaching with you know, paying out of pocket to get supplies that they need and things. I can't imagine what it's like for music because it's pretty low on the totem pole. And people, I think, would do well to reinvigorate it into kids' lives and, and recognize it for the essential that it is, like in Europe, where it's a much more subsidized, much more daily part of everyone's lives, and they're better for it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's basically like another language that you learn or another, another system that you learn how to operate with. And it could, you know, it's, it's similar to mathematics in that way. But um, I think it's, it just it's gets... Probably not without... Sorry, I mean to cut you off. Uh, yeah, just, it just seems like some people, some people think that it's very easy. <laughs> and it is not. It takes a really long time to, to really focus and become decently... Um, able to communicate within the, within yeah. the realm of that. And the good thing about Oregon Music Hall of Fame is I mean, they have scholarships, they're, they've got people out there raising money, doing classes basically for free, you know, to try to get kids engaged who don't have the opportunities. That's good. Last word? Any last words? Um, the, the fight to educate uh, kids in music is the fight against fascism and totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. Thank you.